All right, go to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. I realize we're going a little backwards here because uh, this was Passover night, uh, this passage, and we've already been through Good Friday and Easter. Uh, but I think this is such a, a tender, wonderful passage of Scripture and a real turning point. Um, you know, when it comes to when we think about communion or the Lord's Supper in the church, this is where that springs from. And so I, I mentioned a, about right before we had our prayer time, when you think about communion, when you think about the Lord's Supper in the church and the times or the times in your life, as from, from maybe for many of us, from the time we were children uh, up, up through now, anything jump to your attention that that is special to you about taking the Lord's Supper? I would have to say it was when we had communion in the garden in the Holy Land. That was a precious, precious time. Uh, we had the privilege, uh, several from the church were in Israel on a trip back 17, 18 years ago. It was 2007 or 8? 2007. Seven? Okay. That's what my passport says. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the opportunity to have communion in, in the Garden of Gethsemane was a, was a precious, precious time, for sure. What about somebody else? Let me ask you, uh, Phil, go ahead. And I'm, I have no doubt that for those that you share communion with, it's a precious time of fellowship and, and communion in the, in the deepest sense of the word. Anybody else? Now, that might be a first. We have a couple with us tonight while they're in traffic. <laughs> Glad we could stream Eric and Eric. <laughs> I won't say a word. <laughs> Just sometimes how you sometimes might take communion for granted. And just yeah. think it's a monthly thing. Yeah. Whenever you're used to going to a church that does it monthly, and then whenever you go to a church that the pastor just says, well, we'll do communion whenever I feel like it's time, and you can go four years out doing communion, and yeah. you come to a church and when you first have that communion, it's like, wow, okay. I, I, you realize what you miss. Yeah. And, and it, it is a precious, precious time. It's one of the few times in, in worship experiences where it's a time just to reflect. It, it's, it's a time to really think about you know, your walk with the Lord and what he's done for you and what he means to you. Uh, I, I get tickled because there's, there's, a, there's a fellow that loved the Lord, truly loved the Lord, and was not, was not uh, very far along in his faith. And uh, we would, he would, when he would come in on, on communion Sundays and he'd see the table set up, he said, I confess one, one time, Maybe some can identify. Well, communion Sunday, he said, oh boy, it's going to be a long one today. <laughs> it's going to, going to be later getting out of the day. Uh, he is with the Lord, and, and uh, I'm sure. Anybody else? Just before we go along.
you need to make sure that you're right with the Lord before you take communion. Uh -huh. And so, and this was a very strict Baptist church, and we would have to sit there and we would pray before we took our communion. And at first, I was afraid. <laughs> you know, I thought, how did, did I tell the Lord everything that I did wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. as, a, as a young girl, I mm -hmm. thought, now it's, it's an honor to share mm -hmm. communion. You know, and, and yeah. That, yeah, that was kind of scary. Uh, it, it brought back to me, and I, and I shared this Friday night at St. Paul uh, before we took communion, and I think I probably shared it here somewhere along the line. But, but about four months ago, getting a, getting a text from my daughter-in-law who, uh, who was telling me that at 41, she just had communion for the very first time in her life. And how overcome and how precious that time was. And how it, how it impacted me was just stopping to think, including myself, how often do we approach communion as just a normal thing when, it, when it's such a precious, precious time. And... Uh, that was a good reminder for me of just how important that time is each month. Okay, anybody else or we want it ready to go? Okay, let's go to verse 7. <laughs> Eric said, I heard that. <laughs> We're proud of you, Eric. <laughs> I'm straight on driving. <laughs> They're just sitting there. <laughs> Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for, they asked. And he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Okay. This is kind of how it gets started. Uh, I think probably one of the questions that we don't have an answer to that often comes up is, was this miraculously done? Or was this something that Jesus lined up? Uh, ahead with this man. Um, one, one observation is when, when he tells them, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Uh, we might not think much about that, but that would be a very unusual sight. Uh, it's usually a woman that's going to carry a jar of water. Um, so he's going to stand out and say, okay, there he is. That's the guy we need to go, go approach. Um, any, any thought, reaction, comment about, about the setup and the arrangement? Okay. Let's go to verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Good reminder to us, they're not sitting at a table with chairs. It's a very table low to the ground, and they're reclining uh, usually on a, on a pillow. They reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this. And divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. 
The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Okay. So let's, let's just take a look at, at the Passover meal as they share it together. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is, is right here we see two cups that, that Luke mentions were, were passed. Um, the very first one is verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not eat again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. You know, he's telling them, he's giving them some real insight again about what's coming. I mean, it's, it's constantly in his message, in the words he's saying to them. Uh, earlier in verse 15, he said, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And, and here, I won't drink it again uh, until the kingdom of God comes. So he's, he's as they're sitting there, and of course, he mentions later on, the hand of the one who's going to betray me is there with me at the table. He's not leaving anything to doubt that this, this is where it's coming to. It's, it's coming to a point, it's coming to a head, and his time of suffering is there. Um, I, I want to mention, because in verse 20, it also says after supper he took the cup. And, and I put up here on the board, uh, there, the, during a the typical Passover meal, there are four cups. Okay, there's the cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, the cup of praise. And it comes from Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And if you want to keep your finger where you are in Luke, but turn back, I think it would be worth our while to read those two, those two verses. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Okay, verses 6 and 7. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Basically four promises. Four promises of God. Promises of deliverance, redemption, sanctification, and praise. Um, the first cup, which was most, most of those who look at, at the account given in, in Luke, most of the, the scholars look at that first cup and that we read about as literally the first cup mentioned, the cup of sanctification. And it comes from the very first part of verse 6. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And it's, it's the first part of the first cup that is shared. Uh, the second cup is the cup of deliverance. And it's, it's from uh, also verse 6. I will rescue you from their bondage. The promise. The cup that we often think about connected to the Lord's Supper as we remember it today is the third cup. And it's um, known as the cup of redemption. And I think it makes sense when you look at, at the promise as found in, in Exodus 6, uh, verse, verse uh, the end of verse 6. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And if you think about 
that particular cup, uh, and, and, and probably I, we, we're jumping out here. We should have probably gone to the bread first, but I, we're already there. So let's go with the cup. It says, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave it to them. And in, in Luke, he, he says it this way. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Okay. Talking about the shedding of his own blood. And the purpose behind that, I'll redeem you. I think it's interesting. He uses both redemption and acts of judgment found in, in, in that passage in Exodus. The redemption comes when he stands in our place. When he takes upon himself our sin. And he takes upon himself the judgment for our sin. The mighty acts of judgment. He's stepping into our shoes. And how redemption comes out of that as he takes God's judgment upon himself. I think about him crying out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's, a, it's, it's an incredible moment to think about. Because as I, as I see it and explore it, it's the one time in all of eternity that he finds himself separated from his father. As far as I can tell, I haven't thoroughly examined this, and you might check it out. I, I, when, he, when he talks to his father, he always uses father. Here, on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the father's turned away. At that moment, the father is allowing his son to take the full wrath and fury of his judgment. And he's doing that for us. So when Jesus talks about this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. From the four cups of wine at Passover, that's looking at the third cup in, in that Passover meal. The Passover meal was was a was a very relaxed worship experience. I mean, it, it was a, it was an evening, and uh, different different in approach from from the meals we think about. Uh, it was it was a, all a time of remembrance and reflection of 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 the first Passover. Any thoughts about that? Any questions about that? When you think about it. What was the significance of the blood in the, in the, in the first Passover? The blood of the lamb that was put on the middle of the door and the door frames so the yeah. angel of death would pass over the house. It was, it was the blood of the sacrificial lamb, right? The unblemished lamb. And, and of course, Jesus is a fulfillment of that. And they would take the blood of the lamb, put it over the doorposts, and the angel of death that would, that would be approaching to take the firstborn of, of all the Egyptians, even the firstborn of animals, passed right over. The idea of Passover. And of course, as we embrace Christ as our Savior and Lord, the only way we enter into the presence of the Lord is through what Christ has done for us. It's not what we've done. I mean, we're totally, totally dependent upon what he's done. And the judgment of God passes over us because Christ has taken it upon himself. He is the sacrificial lamb. So when we take communion, I mean, should we be meditating on those four things that are provided for you? I mean, certainly that would be a, a healthy thing and a wonderful thing to do. So when the... So <laughs> I don't know if this is the appropriate time to talk about all this, but what cup? We only we only have one cup. So what cup? I mean, what is that? Is that? It it would be, it would be the third cup, redemption. the cup of redemption. Okay. And it it's it's the cup, looking back at Exodus six, 
at the end of verse 6, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Of course, the original meaning of that, I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment, is pulling them out of slavery in, in Egypt. And that's, about, that's what's about to happen. And the judgment is falling upon the Egyptians uh, for the bondage they put the Hebrew people in for 400 years. The ultimate judgment is coming upon them in, in, in that tenth plague where the firstborn are claimed. Um, firstborn of the Egyptians. A lot of times when I take communion, I think about sanctification. Mm -hmm. I think about what Christ did, and I, that kind of compels mm -hmm. me to think about what I'm doing. Sure. And, and the, the, the actual promise in, in Exodus 6 that goes with the cup of sanctification is I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. Now, if we personalize that, I'll bring you out from the burdens of sin, from the burdens of everything that keeps us from a right relationship with, with God. Is that making sense? Is that how you think about it when you think about saying? Uh, uh, yeah, I think about, of course, what, what I think about what he did. I think about mm -hmm. his sacrifice, and then I think about, like I said, it compels me to think about, I need, I need to carry my cross. I need to sanctify my life. Mm -hmm. That whole concept of going from his salvation to becoming who he envisions us to be. Well, I, I, I don't know that he, it, as I would understand it, I don't know that, that divinity and humanity were ever separated with Jesus. But when, when I think about it, Mary, I, I think about here is the Son of God, right. fully human, taking our judgment upon himself. And, and when, I, when I go with that thought, that means from the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, the plan has been God was going to offer us an opportunity not to be held accountable and able to, and to, able to come to him. And, and the fact that God himself, when you think about the second person of the Trinity, when you think about coming and being one of us, but fully God as well, God stepped into our shoes and I just marvel, marvel at that. He willingly took the, the punishment, the judgment for our sins upon himself. And, I, you know, I, when I think about that, I think, how can anybody say, well, how do I know God loves me? Well, he just did everything possible, necessary to open up that door to a relationship. And... Uh, you know, you see it right here when, when you think about that. Any other thoughts? Questions? Comments? Yes. I've always been confused, and I think Luke shows it uh, very plainly. Did Jesus speak this way figuratively all the time when he was speaking to groups or to the disciples? I can see now how we really are a step ahead of the disciples because we know what happened. Oh, we're way we're ahead. <laughs> yeah. But here again, when he is speaking figuratively and so on, did they understand what he was actually saying? Because they were doing things that didn't show that they understood. Right. Well, we're, and we're going to see an example of that if we get down there. It's no, no problem we don't. They're going to get into a dispute right there after, after they shared the Passover meal. But this past Sunday, we were looking at, uh, at, at the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus. Uh, you know, he, he, on that journey with them to Emmaus, 
gave them kind of an Old Testament tutorial and helped them understand that this how this was going to happen. So no, the disciples never were. They were trying to understand, and how if we were in their shoes, how would we have understood? How could we? I mean, it was, we, it's something that hadn't been experienced. And then when he appeared at that first resurrection night, when he appeared in the upper room where they were locked away, uh, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but he also basically did the same thing with them. And, and, and like the light came on, they, they understood. It all made sense now. But until his death and resurrection, I don't know how it could have made sense. Because they're listening, they're listening to the person they believed were going to, was going to be the Messiah. Tell them, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to rise again. And that hadn't happened before. And, no, and, I, and I, can't, I can't back this, but I, I'm, uh, I don't know if they ever got past hearing him say he was going to die. I mean, it, it just... This is who they believed was the Messiah. And they'd never really been taught that I can see that there was going to be a suffering Messiah. The expectation was for someone who was going to come and establish the kingdom of God uh, as a mighty king and, and ruler. So, because that's what the rabbis taught. That's what the teachers of the law taught. And... I mean, it, it does, but there was another side to it. There's a, the other side was like Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. And, and nobody was biting on that side of it. Do you know what I mean? They weren't, they weren't embracing it. Um, and, and Jesus, when, he, when he's talking with Cleopas and his friend, when he's, then, he, then when he's talking with uh, the disciples, that, that crowd in the upper room that night of the resurrection, he's, he's giving them understanding as to why that had to happen. And now they see it. And they're, and they're grasping it. And most what of the they really understood was what they heard because they did not have scriptures to read. Right. And it they, was only what they were taught. That's only what they were taught. And they weren't taught a suffering Messiah. Right. Jana, you were going to say something? Well, I think, and I think the block was they never heard this before. I mean, I think it's a major block. But they're actually nose to nose with him. Yeah. How many weeks? And it kept telling them over and over and over. Right. He's going to be leaving again. You know, I, I'll tell you what, what you might not, not just Janet, but all of us can think about, how many times do we read things in Scripture that speak clearly to our lives? And, and I like your phrase, nose to nose. We're, we're looking at it nose to nose, and, and it's clearly saying something, but, and it speaks to our lives and situations of our lives, and we don't buy it. We don't, well, sometimes, sometimes we might grasp it, but we just refuse to, to embrace it. Um, well, let me give you, let me just give you, a, and I'm all of this is a parallel example, but. Every one of us in here, this is, a, this is a Wednesday night after a storm. So all of us in here, we love the Lord. How many of us have seen the Lord work in our lives in powerful ways, in precious ways, and yet find a time we come in our lives where maybe we're up against something or something doesn't go the way we want it to, and... All of a sudden, we wonder, has God forgotten us? Does God care? Is he there? Well, sure he knows. He knows everything about it. He cares deeply, and he's there. He's the same God that was back there helping us through those times, revealing himself to us. Same God. He hadn't changed. But how quickly we forget, you know, sometimes. 
But it, it does make you think. Gets the wheels turning, right? Um, as you're thinking about that, I'm going to back up and do the bread for a second. Uh, in, in verse 19, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. There's a, there's a, a wonderful word translated when it's translated, gave thanks, uh, when he took the bread. And in the Greek, eucharisteo, eucharisteo. And you hear a word, eucharist. Now, that's not a word, we don't usually refer to it in the Baptist church. Okay, uh, first Sunday of the month, we're taking the eucharist. That's more of a, a higher liturgical approach to communion. But... It's a great word for it because it is a time uh, of giving thanks for what God has done for us. So what's the whole deal about the bread? What's the importance? What, what's different about Passover bread than what would typically be used in a Hebrew home? It's unleavened. Unleavened, yes. So it's flat. The loaves are flat. And why was it unleavened for the first? Yeah. They, figured, okay, they didn't have time. Yeah, they didn't have time. They had to get going. They had to be ready to go. Matter of fact, they were to eat with their cloak tucked in their belt, ready to roll when God said go. And, uh, and that's how, that, that's why. When we have uh, communion, take the Lord's Supper, that, that we have unleavened bread. Um, but when you think about taking that bread, what crosses your mind when you take the bread for, for the Lord's Supper? What do you think about? Anything in particular? His body. Okay. His, his body on the cross. Would none of us deserve it? It is an it's a natural time to. Uh, what well, you, what your grandmother said to you, Barbara? I mean, that comes from First Corinthians eleven, and it, and it's the idea that that before we take communion, we do need to take a look at our lives and say, is there anything we need to come clean about before the Lord? Uh, so it's a very natural opportunity to do that. My college roommate quite often would not take communion because of what she thought. She was just that kind of person. If she'd done anything wrong, okay. she wasn't <clears throat> worthy to take it. Okay. Well, and I, I think, you know, I mean, communion is a very, it's a very, it's both a very personal thing, but it's also something we do as a body of believers. But I think as a body of believers, when, when we pass the tray and somebody chooses one particular Sunday not to take it, that's, that's A-OK. -okay. <clears throat> because maybe there's a, there's a good reason. Maybe, for, it could be many reasons, but, you know, that's okay to, 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 to not take it at some point uh, because we don't feel ready to or that, because we're not in a position maybe in our lives where we feel like we really ought to take it. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Parallel, a little example, for, for many years, and I still do every once in a while, but most, most of the time, I would wear a cross uh, for many years, just, just a necklace around my neck. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes I still do if, if I have a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or something without a, without a collar. 
Um, but there have been times in my life along the way when I went to put that cross on, I thought, nobody, your attitude is terrible. You, you, better, work, you better work on that attitude before, before you put that cross on. Uh, or, or just, you know, whatever. Some, there, 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 there were times I didn't uh, because I did not feel like I was the best witness at that point in my life to, to wear it. Um, and I kind of think that's, if somebody let something pass, maybe they're just dealing with something. Maybe they're wrestling with something. And that's okay. I think of, when I think of the bread, I think of Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. And, I mean, what a, what a precious promise that is. Um, you, you know, a good Bible study for you uh, on your own devotional is to follow the concept of bread all the way through the Bible and watch the development of it. Uh, when you think about, okay, you think about the Passover bread. Where would you go with that next? What comes to your mind when you think about bread developing as a concept in the Bible? Anything in the Old Testament jump out to you? Manna. The manna. Absolutely. And the miraculous provision of the manna all the way until they, was, they were settled and established in the promised land. Matter of fact, as you read about the manna, isn't it interesting that along the way, at times they would grumble about it? Manna again? <laughs> but it was a miraculous provision. Anything else you think about when you think about the bread in the Bible? What was in the tabernacle or the temple? The bread of the presence, uh, a, a loaf for each of the 12 tribes on the, bread, the table of the bread of presence, the presence of the Lord in the midst of his people, and an offering. Refreshed each week. Yes. And then, of course, Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And in the midst of this very precious time that he, 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 he was so <clears throat> eager to, to eat with them. Um, and we don't have time to get into this, but isn't it interesting in verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now I am kind of like, come on dudes. <laughs> Can you not sense the, the, just the struggle this is and where this is? Uh, but then sometimes I have to stop and think, all right, am I ever clueless? Am I ever not tuned in to what God is doing and what he wants me to be aware of? Um, are we ever not tuned in to one another and, and what our needs are? But that does, that does kind of mess with me. Any, any last thoughts about, about the Passover meal in the upper room? No, I did not. Didn't go that far. Well, it's just a simple thing that it reminds me of Job. Satan went and asked, demanded. Mm -hmm. Well, it says asked here, but one version uh, that I read said demanded that Simon be, well, that all of them be sifted as wheat. Mm -hmm. And it, it just reminds me of sure. the book of Job. Sure. Will he remain faithful when things go wrong? Which in a lot of ways is exactly what Simon Peter the Rock was going to be dealing with. Kind of hit me when he, he called him Simon and then later, and a verse or so later calls him Peter. Yeah. You know, called him Simon and then Peter. Yeah. I love the, the verse 32. We didn't, we didn't get down to this, but I, I talked about it the Sunday I preached about Peter's denial. I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I love the concept there. Jesus knew he was going to deny him. 
So when he says, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. What I hear him praying is that when you fall, you come back. I'm praying you come back. I'm praying you come back strong. So that you will be that person, the rock I envision you to be. You will be that person who will be of help to your brothers to strengthen them. I'm a little amazed sometimes that Peter didn't question his, the bread representing his body. Mm -hmm. Because Peter was pretty bold. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm sure because it was a long meal, right. I'm sure that uh, there's a whole lot. We aren't told it happened, but yeah. Well, I'm sure their brains were spinning <laughs> trying to trying to think it through. Okay. I really question when Jesus told uh, him to go ahead and go and do what he must do. They really didn't question when he got in that river, did they? We aren't told. Because we aren't told in, in here, and at least right here, uh, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Now, a little later on, he would head out. But, okay. You might, if you're looking for a, for a, a change up in your daily Bible study, you might do a, get out the good old concordance and do a, a, a study on the word bread in the scriptures and follow it. Let's stand together. Let's have prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word. And even as we're three days past resurrection day, I look back upon that entire week, that first Holy Week, marveling at your plan, at your love for us, the love of Christ for us, his obedience to the plan of salvation. And Father, we, we hear him say, if anyone will come after me, must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So, Lord, as we read about your son, as we read about how he ministered and, and the path he took, may we be willing to walk as you lead us in his footsteps. May you draw us ever closer to you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. By the way, this coming Sunday, we're having the Lord's Supper. So you're ready. <laughs>